This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. In 1994, history teacher Rodney Wilson made history. That's when he decided to share an important truth with his class at Melville High School, that he was gay. And in doing so, Rodney sent shockwaves through his South St. Louis County District with parents calling for his firing and accusing him of indoctrinating their kids into an unnatural homosexual lifestyle. Rodney made another decision that year with historical consequence. Not only did he come out, he also founded Gay History Month in October. It's considered the first organized effort to recognize gay history and the people who lived it. And three decades later, the commemoration continues as LGBT History Month. Rodney Wilson was back in St. Louis this week to celebrate the 30th anniversary of this commemorative month at the Missouri History Museum's Gateway to Pride exhibit. Here is producer Danny Wisentowski with that conversation. Rodney, before we get to the founding of Gay History Month, I want you to take us back to this moment in 1994. You're teaching history to a group of 14 and 15-year-olds. The day's lesson is about the Holocaust. You point to a poster that shows different patches that the Nazis forced people to wear in their concentration camps, and you point to the pink triangle, and you say, in effect, that's the one that I would have worn. And that is how you come out to your class, and it changes your life in, in so many ways. Why was that the moment that you chose to reveal this part of yourself to them. I had been at the United States uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. the week prior. That museum was one year old at the time. And while I was there, I bought this poster you referred to, and it had the various types of patches that various uh, inmates in concentration camps would wear. And it is inclusive, including the pink triangle. I thought with my students at that time. It was in March. I'd been with them now for six, seven months. They knew me. I knew them. I felt this could be an important time and an appropriate time and appropriate occasion to make that lesson real. To say, I couldn't say, I'm Polish, therefore. I'm Jewish, therefore. But I could say, this pink triangle could have been for me. I could have been one of the individuals at this time period arrested under paragraph 175 of the German code. I could have been put into a prison. About 15,000 homosexual men, uh, we think, died in concentration camps during the Second World War. So it seemed completely appropriate to me. It seemed proper. It seemed like a teachable opportunity, a moment to connect my students with this history that to them often history seems something way out there a long time ago that doesn't affect them in any way. So it seemed like it was the right time to do so. What do you recall about the reaction of your students in the classroom at that moment? Do, do they say anything? Is there a, a heaviness in, in the air? I think there was a bit of heaviness at the beginning. I think there was some surprise maybe at the beginning. I think it took a little while for the students to understand fully what I had said and the import of the words I had spoken to them. There were then a few questions that a few students had after that, uh, but generally I think there was either silence as they absorbed what had happened and tried to understand fully, a few questions, and then we moved on to other topics involving that particular lesson and that particular poster. That is the same year that you create what we now know as Gay History Month, and an observance that has expanded in a way we have pride parades, we have an awareness of what it means to be gay and to see gay people talking about themselves. That is not 1994. Why found a month? What was the need for an observance? And why decide to do it that way? 
Well, obviously, I was not taught any LGBTQ history in my K-12 education, 1970 to 1983. Uh, I was not taught any of LGBTQ history in my undergraduate work. But when I started graduate classes at the University of Missouri-St. Louis in the history department, I had a particular professor, Gerda Ray, who allowed us to talk about and examine anything including social history, including LGBTQ history. So my mind was open because of those classes I was taking, and I think that history empowered me. It helped me understand better my place in the world. It helped me connect a dot from the past to a dot in the present, which was my own life. So I think very much like Dr. Carter Woodson in 1926 when he founded what was then called Negro History Week, now Black History Month, it was for the same intention. He believed that knowing black history was empowering for black people and educational for white people. And I believe the same thing. So I took Dr. Carter Woodson's idea regarding Black History Month in February. I took the idea of Women's History Month in March. And I said, let's do the same thing for then called Lesbian and Gay History Month. Let's designate it for this October, 1994, because that's in the academic calendar. The first march on Washington was in October of 79. The second one was in October of 87. We already had National Coming Out Day on October 11 from 1988 forward. So I said, let's adopt and adapt these models that already exist, but now put the spotlight toward LGBTQ people and their history. I did not know any gay students, but me and my friends constantly used the word gay to bully each other, to bully ourselves in ways. Am I doing, is what I'm wearing today, are they going to call me gay? Is what I'm saying, is that is that cool or is that gay? It was this incredibly pervasive word in my upbringing. And when I think about this era, take us into that time for you and what kids were living in at that time. Was this a barrier that is the language of even just talking about this. We didn't have words like queer that have been reclaimed in a lot of ways. Was there a difficulty in even finding a way to talk with these kids about it? Did it feel like the culture was far away or or getting in the way of this discussion? Both. It seemed to me that swirling outside of my classroom were all kinds of conversations about gay and lesbian people. You had the AIDS crisis in the early 1990s, starting in 1981. You had Bill Clinton come to office in January 1993. He had promised to end the prohibition against gays in the military. He wasn't able to do that. We had conversations about what is the right place for gay people? What's their proper place in society? Eventually, we ended up with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You had Pedro Zamora, you had Alan Schindler, you had Ryan White, you had another march on Washington in uh, 1993. So a lot of things are percolating outside the classroom. But in my classroom, these were not topics we discussed. I had an 800-page American history textbook at the time. It was published in the late 1980s. And in 800 pages, there was not one reference of any kind to an LGBTQ person identified as such or to any LGBTQ history. So while the conversations were raging, and sometimes they trickle down into the regular world from the political world, for example, or the religious world, for example, most of these were outside of my classroom at the time. It strikes me, you know, this moment where you come out to your class, you have to reach back to a historical event generations beforehand in a different country to draw a connection to what was happening to gay people that year in 1994. Is there a frustration, you know, as someone who is immersed in history and trying to reach those kids that you couldn't talk about perhaps what was happening in their world right now? You had to say, if you had lived in Germany, you could have been asking if you live in America right now. Is there... Is there something special about what history does give us, that it gave you that thread to reach out to them in that moment? Absolutely. I think we are born thinking we're the center of the universe, 
thinking that the universe was created the day we were born. Education is about the process of taking a person outside of themselves and introducing them to the bigger world of art, literature, science, in my case, history. And I think history is profoundly important. If we're going to be fully realized in our human potential, we have to understand what came before we arrived. What is this stream that we find ourselves in? Where did it come from? Where is it heading? I think it's also really important, of course, to try to learn lessons from the past, to try to be able to empathize with people who lived in other countries at different times under different circumstances. That helps make us fully human, the ability to have empathy. So in my view, yes, I was trying to say to these students at South County, St. Louis in 1994, who were teenagers, there's a world that existed long before you came here. And sometimes people acting in that world behave terribly. We need to be aware of that. You know, history does always rhyme. You know, even if it doesn't repeat, there's always a rhyme to history. And I think it's so important when we teach history to not just say, and then World War II happened in 1914 and ended in 1918. I think that's cool information, but that doesn't help us prevent the next world war. That doesn't help us understand how the world came out of control and this war erupted, the Great War. So history that does not try to get students to understand a lesson from it that will make their lives better, the lives of their community better, I think is history that's only going so far but not far enough. That year in 1994, you really begin organizing this month, um, Gay History Month, and you're, you're bringing history into the present. You're not asking people to look back. You're, you want them to attend an event. What was it like trying to figure out what that should look like? Why October? October, for the reasons uh, that I mentioned that I think are um, appropriate, because you want to hang it on something. So in 1979, for the first time ever, LGBTQ people went to Washington in mass and said, we want equal rights. So that was a good event to, to remember with the time of uh, celebration. Um, but I think that it was a hard experience to organize something, to call it into existence. I had a lot of good people who were helping me. After I wrote that initial proposal in January of 94, I sent it out to all the then known queer organizations and said, what do you think about this idea? Will you endorse this idea? Will you support this idea? And from that, I was able to collect a coordinating committee of really smart, energetic, capable people all over this country who believed in the same thing, who wanted the same thing. So over very quickly, actually, because January 94, the proposal is sent out. By May of 94, a National Coordinating Committee is organized. By October 94, we're implementing it. Here in St. Louis, on the campus of the University of Missouri-St. Louis, Lucas Hall, Room 100, on October the 3rd, 1994, we gathered for a film festival. And every Monday in October, at least the first four Mondays of October 1994, we were there in Lucas Hall 100 on the UMSL campus, kicking off the first series of events ever for what's now called LGBTQ History Month, which has also spread beyond the United States now into 20 other locations. We need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll learn about the global impact LGBT History Month has had since its founding 30 years ago. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. I'm Elaine Cha. Let's return to producer Danny Wisentowski's conversation with Rodney Wilson, history teacher and founder of LGBT History Month. Here's Danny. Rodney, you mentioned how many other countries have also established a similar month to honor the history of its, of its gay people, of, of LGBT people. And what really stands out to me is they don't all choose October. It is, in fact, all over the calendar of, of these various different countries. 
it seems this rich blend, as you said, there's something specific about each history of these places, but yours was the first. Do you feel some commonality with these other celebrations across the world? And, and do you see something beautiful in the fact that they didn't all choose October? They, they made their own history months. Absolutely. I always say to any group that's asking me, how do I do this? I always say, you pick the month that works for you. It does need to be in the academic calendar. It has to happen when secondary schools and colleges and universities are in session. Other than that, you find a month that works because it goes back to some event in your history in a particular month that you want to call back. And you're right. It, there, there are history months that happen in February, in March, in May, in April, in June, in November, a lot in October. So it just depends on the location. The first history month after the United States was in the United Kingdom in 2005. This last July of 2024 was the 20th location. They picked July, and that's New Zealand. So we have an international committee now with representatives of all of these different history months. We meet quarterly via Zoom. We help each other with any problems that have come up in our own places. We work with people who want to start new ones. For example, Spain and Brazil and Venezuela next year are hoping to start their first LGBTQ History Month. So we're now together. We're connected. We know who each other is. You know, we can send emails to each other. We can have conversations about how to start them in another location. Rodney, you mentioned a bit about your own upbringing and the way that history inspired you and that a teacher who opened that space for your inspiration, how important that was. Um, you grew up in rural Missouri in a fundamentalist church. Talk to us about how your experiences around history as, as a kid, how did that lead to your interest in telling LGBT history to others? I was always a curious kid, and I always felt that I was somehow displaced. I didn't quite understand my place or purpose in the world. And for me, initially, I used religion as a means to do that. My parents were not religious. They did not take me to church. I went on my own. I'd be the first one up on Sunday morning. I'd walk down the street to the Baptist church. Mom would have put a quarter out for the offering plate. I felt really good about going to church. But in the end, that wasn't sufficient for me. Then I became interested in family history, which helped me ground my family, my DNA, how it came to be into a person who I was. Uh, and then finally, history, American history, and then world history. And I found it to be uh, incredibly empowering. I found it to uh, put me in a place that I understood my role in life and I understood what I could do uh, in this uh, short life that, that I would have, like everyone's short life. And history became, in a sense for me, a touchstone and a cornerstone of my philosophy and my lifestyle. One of the criticisms the backlash that you faced after you came out to your class is, I think, one that is very familiar throughout history. You're accused of indoctrinating your students. Talking about your sexuality might turn them gay, or that is at least the argument. This was something that was treated very seriously, um, and it is something that is absurd um, on its face. How did you wrestle with communicating to these parents who perhaps in their twisted way were terrified of their children being gay for perhaps the danger they might face, but wrapped up in, in so much fear and so much oppression and so much, let's just not talk about this, then it won't be real. Did you have to break through that? And was it hard to, to try to do that? This was my fourth year teaching. So at this point, I had a reputation having had four groups of students over four years. And I think that was helpful. I had a good rapport with students. I had a good rapport with their parents. They'd come to open house, for example. So while there was criticism, some of it was quite vocal. There were some raucous school board meetings in which people said some really awful things. But generally, my students overwhelmingly had faith in me. And even if they didn't understand what was going on, or even if they didn't agree with it, they had some sense of faith 
that I'm not going to lead them down a bad path. And I think that was communicated to their parents. So while there was controversy, uh, there were school board meetings that got out of hand, there was one denunciation on the floor of the United States House of Representatives, overwhelmingly, I think, my colleagues at that school, the administration at that school, and my students were generally supportive. You were the first openly gay K-12 teacher in the state, if I'm understanding, at least the only one to, to come out in that way. Um, part of this contradiction is that presumably there have been many, many gay teachers, many gay students. Um, this is now, your role is part of the Missouri History Museum's Gateway to Pride exhibit that's going to be up through the summer of 2025. Did you ever have an inkling that coming out to your students as part of a lesson plan would now become part of history? Not at all, of course. I didn't know what would be the immediate aftermath. I was not a tenured teacher at the time, so I didn't have some of those unique protections that a tenured teacher would have. I did have the Missouri NEA and the National NEA on my side, and that was very helpful. But no, when we do something like that, we don't know. I mean, in theory, I could have been removed from the classroom immediately. That's happened before to other teachers in other locations. I could have been fired at the end of the fourth year, not granted a fifth-year contract. I could have been let go at the end of the fifth year, not granted a tenured contract. So any of this could have happened. The fact that the story began to get some coverage, like that August 1994 Riverfront Times cover that Jeanette Batts wrote, uh, that was very helpful because the school district, if there had been those who wanted to put this under a rug, get me out of the school, uh, they would have been aware that people were watching, that media was interested, and so they couldn't do something in darkness because uh, a story in the Riverfront Times, for example, would bring that out into the light. In regard to this Gateway to Pride exhibit, it's phenomenal. 6,000 square feet, the Missouri History Museum, I encourage everybody to get to the Missouri History Museum to see that. It is an enormously proud moment for all St. Louisans, not just LGBTQ St. Louisans, to see what we now have on exhibit at the Missouri History Museum, one of our great St. Louis uh, institutions. So much about today is different compared to what you were facing there in 1994, but you have seen other teachers more recently who have lived through very similar experiences. One was John Wallace, I believe, in, in 2021. He was a speech and debate teacher. He put up a rainbow flag and a poster. Parents complained. He was accused, like you, that he was teaching his kids to be gay, that this was something that could be secret, you know, smuggled into their being through learning something in a classroom. He did resign from that position. Um, and he was born, I think, as you were quoted around this time, that he was born four years after the events that you went through. What was it like to talk with John and these other teachers? And, and what does it feel like to, to see what must be a very painful example of history rhyming? The John Wallace incident was so disappointing. I was shocked that these years later, that kind of event could happen with a young teacher who, as you said, was born after these events happened to me. I got in touch with him just as a person of support because he was a teacher here in Missouri. Uh, he and I are still in touch uh, since then. I also have been really discouraged and frustrated by recent moves in various state legislatures to codify, quote unquote, don't say gay legislation, particularly targeting transgender people. Here in Missouri, we have been a leading state, sadly, with various representatives proposing various types of legislation that it's terribly harmful and terribly hurtful. A study just came out last week that in those states that pass anti-transgender legislation, you see an increase in attempts of suicide at sometimes 72 percent. So when politicians are persecuting a group of people, particularly young people, they need to be aware that their language can sometimes be that language which pushes a young person over the edge. 
And I'm very frustrated with what's happening in Missouri and some of our other states, Oklahoma, for example, very frustrating that all these years later, we haven't yet come to consensus, community consensus, that all citizens are equal and that everyone should have an equal opportunity in a safe environment in our public schools to achieve the very best academic success they possibly can. You cannot be successful academically if you're being persecuted, picked on, bullied, made fun of, ignored. You can't. If we want all young people to have an equal educational opportunity, we have to make it possible for all young people to be represented in schools and to be there safely. You know, I'm wondering, you know, we're talking a lot about history, and I think there is a future here also looming right in front of it. There is a lot of different ways that groups in this country mark their culture. The Holocaust is, is one example of the way that that event has become marked throughout the year. Black history, Asian American history, all of these things have their own different unique qualities, and not just when we mark them on the calendar. It seems like we are in a moment of an interesting tension for how to mark the importance of gay history. When you're looking at the future of gay history, so to speak, where do you see those discussions falling? What is interesting to you and what is new to you as a student of history and someone who is living this very directly? That we are having these conversations is good. My hope, though, is that over time, we become a warmer, more welcoming community, all of us, no matter what our ethnic background, whatever our employment background, whatever our sexual orientation or gender identity or religion. I hope that we can just learn to let everybody live in peace. As long as no one is hurting another person, there should be no reason to try to restrict their behavior. Allow people to have autonomy over their lives, over themselves, over their persons. Stop trying to get in everyone's business. I think that would be also beneficial. There's part of me that is concerned about the future, and there's part of me that's really hopeful. I do see that young people today are not taking much of the nonsense that we in the past took. Young people are really over these nonsensical conversations and questions. And they're just forging a path, a a path forward. So while I have concerns about young people, as everyone does, about our reading, writing, math skills, and so on, I also have a great faith in young people and the future that I think, ultimately, they will be able to create for all of us. That was Rodney Wilson, history teacher and founder of LGBT History Month with producer Danny Wisentowski. LGBT History Month is celebrating 30 years in the U.S. You can find out more about its origins as well as other notable moments in queer history at the Missouri History Museum's Gateway to Pride exhibit, which will be open through summer of 2025. This episode was produced by Maya Norfleet. Our audio engineer is Aaron Doerr. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.